Welcome to History, Prophecy, and Current Events. I'm your host, Renee Magalit, and this broadcast is a weekly conversation between myself and my husband, Joe. Yep, and our goal is really to help you understand what's going on today. That's right. He's the one who reads widely about history, prophecy, and current events. And she likes to ask me a lot of questions. That's right. And tonight, I'm going to be asking him questions about Scripture. What does Scripture say about Israel getting her land? And then, what is actually happening today in Israel with annexing Judea and Samaria? And then, I'm going to be asking him about all the tension in the world about this. So let's hit the introduction and get started right away. This is big. This is big. Thanks for joining us on History, Prophecy, and Current Events. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. Yep. Well, Joe, we have a lot to talk about this evening. Yeah. Renee, I, I want to start with saying this. Do you realize that the church has done a terrible job glorifying God for the work that he's done in history to bring Israel back to her land to make her a nation, and to be working even to, to th this day to give her more and more and more of a land. He's been doing it slowly but surely over all of these years, and we have not sufficiently given him the glory for all that he's doing. Well, or even pray as a church for what God is doing there and with that nation. Because God said he's going to bless all the nations of the world through Israel. And that, that's, that's a miracle. All right, and so what we need to do, since maybe we haven't had our antenna up or haven't, been, haven't learned about it or haven't been taught about it, we want to take you back to a scripture this evening to explain what is God doing. Right, I, I, I want to glorify God in reading these scriptures, and hopefully as I read them, you'll get a kind of a feel for how awesome God is in the exact words that the Holy Spirit put down to alert us in several ways. I mean, our emotions, our psyche, psychologically, we should be uh, put um, on uh, bells going off. Boom, 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 uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. We should be aware of certain things which God is doing to help us to pray and realize, wow, this, this is so, so, so important. So I wanna read this first prophecy, okay? It's about something God's gonna do here in the future but it alerts us, pay attention to the words, because it alerts us to some of the problems the nations are having with the nation of Israel today. Okay, it's, so listen. It's no surprise. Right, it's no surprise. It's from Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And this prophecy about what's going to happen in the future is because what nations have been doing up to this point. And this is what it says, For behold, in those days... And at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have, what have the nations done? Listen, they've scattered them among the nations, and they've divided up my land. Well, there's the two things that they did, Renee. They, so they yeah. scattered them, mm -hmm. and they divided up their land. Yeah. One of the first things that I do when I look at a passage of Scripture, and this um, prophecy that Joe is reading from is from Joel. It's in the Old Testament. And I look for what is God doing. So when I read this here, I see a couple of things. So I'm going to look for, you know, God speaks in the first person here. And it says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So what's God going to do? Yeah, he's, Just, ref yeah, he's restoring the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. And you can see how Israel is one of the top nations. They're, they're ranked the number eight nation in the world in terms of power, strength, riches. Mm -hmm. And they're such a small nation, Renee, in the whole world. Are you, I just, 
they're like one of the, the, the number one nation technologically in the world. Yeah. And they're the number one nation in farming techniques in the world. And mm -hmm. they're the number one nation in just the medical stuff coming out of Israel. It's just unbelievable. But what's and, interesting and to note is who is going to restore the fortunes to Judah and Jerusalem? Who? God, God says, I will. Yeah. Yeah. And so here is what is the time God is doing? It's, that's now. We're talking right now. God is already restoring to them fortunes and they're finding things like oil. Can you imagine that? The mm -hmm. amount of oil that they found and gas. Mm -hmm. And these are things that the churches should be thanking God for. When we see those things happen, because God made a, made a, um, a promise in Genesis chapter 12. Mm -hmm. If you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse them, you'll be cursed. So now God's going to talk about the curses. Here's the curses. Well, what did the nations do, Renee? Wait, where they are we? They scattered are we gonna, them. Are we this, still in this, Joel? Yeah, Joel. Yeah. What did the nations do? They scattered Israel. Yeah. So you can talk through all of history after 70 AD when the Romans scattered them. Mm -hmm. And they went all over Europe and in different places. And they had to move from nation to nation. Why? Because they got kicked out. Mm -hmm. The British kicked them out, the French kicked them out, the Spanish kicked them out, killed them, the Germans, you know, Russia, it's just all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they're just moving all around, and this is exactly what God said these nations would do to Israel. So he was very prophetic. But if you blessed Israel mm -hmm. and Jews while they were in your land, you would have been blessed. The nation would be blessed. And that's a very important thing. And so we see from this passage of scripture, very clearly, don't scatter Israel, don't divide the land of Israel. So here's a question. <clears throat> okay, when did, when did Joel prophesy? Like how long ago? Well, this would be at least uh, almost 2,600 years ago. Okay, so if somebody prophesied, got a prophet prophesied 2,600 yeah. years ago, is it still good? I mean, yeah. really, it's been so long. Yeah, because God's word is eternal, Renee. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever, everybody. And then and I, so I do, I mean, I asked that question for you because I thought maybe you might be thinking that. But here's another one of my favorite passages in Numbers um, 19, 23. 23, 19. Uh, 23, 19. I'm a little dyslexic here. Okay. <laughs> God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he not said it, will he not do it? Has he spoken, will it not come, come to pass? That's right. So if he said it, he'll do it. And that's the good thing about God. He never right. changes his mind. So listen up, everybody. What I want to do is go into a few more scriptures, and then I want to take you back into history into the 1800s and bring you up today and talk about this annexing of the land that you're hearing about. And Benjamin Netanyahu says they're going to annex parts of Judea and Samaria. And we really want to talk about that. That's end times prophecy happening on our watch, Renee. This is a pretty exciting thing. But let's talk about a few of these prophecies. Okay. okay? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. I'm All right? There. You're going to yep. get there? Yep. Hold on. Three. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. Okay. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall, what, Renee? Possess it. Yep. Okay, this is a very important passage. When they go back to their land, they shall possess it. Do they possess all of their land today? No. Okay, that area called Judea, Samaria, the world calls the West Bank. It's not the West Bank. It's the land of Israel. Okay, so for people who didn't listen last week, tell us why it's called the West Bank. The West Bank of what? Right, it's the West Bank. It's west of Jordan, the nation of Jordan. And so the Jordanians annexed that land to themselves for 19 years after the war in 1948 and 49. Mm -hmm. And the world didn't have a problem with them annexing the land. And so this is, this is them taking the land and dividing the land of Israel. Um, and it's not going well for Jordan today. So Jordan said they would go to war over Israel annexing land. 
so did Turkey, so did Iran. So how, so how long there's ago? There's a lot of people. Now, that was happening right now, Renee. That's this Today, week. This yeah, week. this week. Okay, so okay. today is June 10th, if I got my days right, right? Today's June 10th. So it's 2020, in case you're listening to this in replay. Right, so there's very important cities in Israel, ancient cities, which are very important to the history of Israel, like Hebron and Shechem and Shiloh and Bethlehem, right, and Bethel, mm -hmm. these cities are going to go back. Why? Because God said they are. Don't look at the circumstances of the world. Don't look at politics, economics. Don't look at all those things. Look at God's word. And so you know God is going to do this. And it's going to be a miracle how it happens. I'm sure it will and be. And so when I see the world saying, we're going to go to war, we're going to go to war, they're going to lose big time. Turkey, you don't even have a chance. There's not... You don't have a chance of well, beating Israel. Why? Because Israel's God is bigger, better than any God. He's the only God. He is so strong, Renee. He, he doesn't lose wars. That's right. So this is what's going to happen. And so I so we have. So you can have confidence that what God says right. will come to be. And not just confidence, but you should be looking for God to be doing what he said he's going to do. Right, so go over to Amos chapter 9. This is an important verse. I think a very important verse. I think Christians need to get a hold of what God is saying here in this verse because what God lays down here is happening now. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to explain that All right. to you. And we'll read, I'm going to read some current headlines that I put about this. Okay. Okay, after we go into these books. I got three books from the 1800s. And by the way, uh, don't worry if you don't have paper and pencil to take notes because we have note study guide for you. We have a link for where you can find these books available um, in our study notes. So you can just sign up to get those. Okay, so Amos chapter 9 verse 13 says this, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and the hills will be dissolved. Now, I've been in the mountains of Israel, and I got to sit in a restaurant that had wine from those mountains, and it was really good. This is already being fulfilled. But then he says something very, very important, Renee. Listen to this. And I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. So what is God doing? He's restoring the captivity. That's what he's doing even now. He's restoring the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. Okay, so now Israel's already been doing that up and down the coast, inside on the Golan Heights, but not in Judea Samaria like they need to. There are still cities in Judea Samaria that are not possessed and they're not being lived in by Jews. Mm -hmm. And God, the God of all the creation who created the heavens and the earth says, this is what I'm going to do with my people Israel. I'm restoring their captivity and I am giving them their cities back and they will live in them and they will plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens, eat their fruit. And now this is very, this is the part that I, I blows me away. I will plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now, there's been so many churches through the ages, Renee, that said, well, God's done with Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, if God was done with Israel, then he broke this promise. And God is not a man yeah. that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Right, and so many, yeah. many people say, well, when Israel came back, to the land after the Babylonian captivity. They were um, 70 years in captivity and that a remnant came back. They said that remnant coming back um, is the second coming of the Jews coming back into the land. Well, if that's true, then God broke this promise. Why? Why? Because in 70 AD, they were all scattered yeah. and thrown out of the land. That, this cannot be that promise. Right. You know what? This promise is being fulfilled right now. They are not going to be uprooted from their land. Why? Because it says, which I have given them. What is God doing there, Renee? Giving it to them. He's giving the land to them. Let and me, that's it is happening right now. This is current. 
prophecy. And I'm asking that your hearts, Christians, would be sufficiently moved to glorify God, to begin to thank him more for what he's doing right now in the world. That's what he's doing. He's giving the cities back to his people, Israel. So can I make a parent? Yeah. I'd like to make a parenthetical comment here. So it really doesn't matter what Joe or I think, okay? So, but what we want you to do is to know how to look at the scripture for yourself. So when you look at a scripture, the first thing you wanna look at, so let's say you're gonna go to Joel and read this, right? You look and ask yourself, what is God doing? And then what is God saying? Okay, but it's like the most important thing is what is God doing? And look for that and look for the very basic meaning of the text. Yes. Okay, and the Holy Spirit, you ask him, he will be your teacher, he will show you. If you don't understand, he will help you. So we really wanna encourage you not just to listen to us, we're happy to teach, right? But we want you to learn for yourself, to look for yourself. Right, and so Satan, Renee, has to respond yeah. to what God is doing. So mm -hmm. I want to take you back 1800s, okay? And this little book. So 1800s, that's 1800s. like almost 1800 years after the Jews were scattered right. um, in 70 AD. Okay, so this guy, David Barron, um, he was uh, born in 1855, okay? What country Rus was he, he from? He was Russia. He's a Russian? Yep. And his name's Barron? Yep, and he was an Orthodox Jew. Okay, interesting. But he became a Christian. And he's one of my favorite authors. I've read a lot of his books. And he had a goal to teach Christians the Hebrew scriptures and teach them prophecy. And so what he did was he wrote a lot on the Psalms, and I love the Psalms, and he's written on several of the books of the Bible, Zechariah being one of them. I love his book of Zechariah. So this book right here is called The Shepherd of Israel and His Scattered Flock. Okay? And so it's all about just one psalm, Psalms 80. And so this, get this book and read it about Psalms. What is Psalms 80 about? Well, here's what's very interesting. God raised up a man during the time of David. His name is Asaph. And Asaph was the band leader. He was the guy leading the music. He was a band leader. Oh, that kind of a band. I yeah, thought you that, meant like a gang. He was like, you know, the singer. He's at the temple and leading everybody, okay. leading the band. No, wait a minute. There's a, there's, what do they call it in... Um, in a Jewish service, the, they don't call it a band leader. They call it the cantor. Is it yeah. Like, would it be like the cantor? Well, no, not no. in David's time at the temple. Okay. okay. All right. So he, I don't know But anything. he wrote Psalms. And so I want to take you into Psalms 80. And he's a prophet. The Bible says that Asaph not only led the worship and the music, but he was a prophet. And so in Psalms 80, this is one of his prophecies. Um... And this is what he says here, and it's very interesting to me, okay? Think, think now, think as a Christian what you hear. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel. Well, do you have a shepherd? Is he a good, the good shepherd? Yes. The shepherd of Israel is the Messiah of Israel. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So listen to what he says. The prophet is speaking to you. He says, Give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You are enthroned above the cherubim. Shine forth. Okay, this phrase, shine forth, only occurs three times. In the scriptures? In the scriptures. But each time it's connected to a portion of scripture that is prophecy of God bringing his people back to the land, Renee, yeah. and blessing them. And that's what Psalms 80 talks about. It's a prophecy of how God is scattering Israel, punishing them, and then bringing them back. Can I say something? So, you know, Joe was addressing Christians and encouraging us to, like, look at this and see what this means. But for my Israeli and Jewish friends out there who may be listening, I want to say this is your scripture. Yeah. And your God is talking to you about what he's doing. And that's a really, really marvelous thing. Yes, absolutely. Exciting. Ask and him so to I show you. Yeah. Here's Asaph the prophet. Listen to what he says here in verse 14 down to verse 19 in Psalms 80. He says, O God of hosts, turn now again, beseech thee, look down from heaven and see, and take care of this vine. Well, well what happened to the vine? Man, it's all messed up, scattered everywhere, whatever. 
and it's a, it's a problem. Uh, he he says, remind his people? His people, Israel. Okay. Even the shoot which your right hand has planted, and on the son whom thou hast strengthened for himself, it is burned with fires, cut down, they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. Who's the man of his right hand? Who's at his right hand today? And upon the son of man, whom you will make strong for yourself, then we shall not turn back from you. See, there's a day coming when all the Jews will be saved and they will not turn back from the Lord. Revive us and we will call upon your name. Revive us. So we will call upon the name of the Lord. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. That's a relationship. Restore, yes. That's a relationship. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. And when God, when he prays here, restore us, the other Psalms from Asaph are restore us by giving us our land. The inheritance which God has given. Mm -hmm. Okay, this shine forth is in another Psalm by Asaph, Psalms 50. So go over to Psalms 50, Renee. And look, look at this. Okay. I got to get there. All right, Psalms 50. That's what he says. The mighty one, God, the Lord has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. May our God come and not keep silent. Fire devours before him and is very tempestuous around him. So it sees. You see that? God has what? He shines forth. I'll read, I'll read it to you in the ESV. Yeah. This, this reads a little easier. It's in verse 3. It says, Our God comes. He does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him is a mighty tempest. Yeah. And so God, our God, this is, he's a great God. Yeah. And he's going to do mighty things, Lord, for us and for Israel. And this is constantly in the scriptures, Renee. Mm -hmm. And then there's one more verse I want to look at. It's Psalms 94, real quick. And it's the same thing. Oh, verse 1, O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. Now, let's go back to the first verse we read, Renee, Joel 3, mm -hmm. 1 and 2. Why is God avenging himself on all the nations of the world because what did they do to God's people I mean you talk about racism the anti-semitism of just scattering the people and then forcing them killing them in this land forcing them out taking all their property stealing it from them which has happened to the Jews over and over again in all of these nations it's evil and God the God of vengeance will shine forth and that day when he comes and he's going to bring the wood to the world because of this very thing. Well, and you might wonder, why would God want to take vengeance? Well, I'm just thinking he hates evil, right? Yeah. And he will always make things right because he loves justice and righteousness and mercy. Right. Yeah. And so I'm excited because the 1800s, what happened, Renee, is among Christians... All of a sudden, there rose up people and going, wait a minute, all this teaching that the scriptures have nothing to do with Israel anymore, that's wrong. And so very prominent pastors started rising up and saying, what we've been taught from others is wrong, and we're not going to put up with it anymore. And the main thing was when they were reading the Old Testament, Renee, they would see it as literal. They would say, wait a minute, these prophecies that God has given us not about the church it's about Israel, what God's going to do with Israel, yeah. and people would turn that around. And one of them I love is J.C. Ryle. He wrote this book in 1867. Think about this. God is starting the Zionist movement, but this guy wrote a book, okay, and he was the Bishop of Liverpool. That's in okay, England. Among yeah. Anglicans, the Church of England, right? And they did not believe in Israel. They didn't believe, and so he confronted the church. I want to read several of the things that he wrote. He wrote down 11 things. He called it his prophecy creed. Okay. Renee, a this prophecy is his prophecy creed. creed. From I'm not gonna, Ryle. Yeah, from uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read all 11 of them, but you get the book called Are You Ready for the End of Time? We, ha we have the link in on the notes. He said, one, I believe that the world will never be completely converted to Christianity by any existing agency before the end comes. 
in spite of all that can be done by ministers, churches, schools, missions, the wheat and the tares will grow together until the harvest. And when the end comes, it will find the earth in much the same state as it was when the flood came in the days of Noah. Okay, so what's so, his point? Wow. That was, he, a, that was okay, a mouthful. Now, listen, what his point is this, is that things are going to get worse and worse and worse. That's not what many Christians were saying. It was going to get better and better and better and better. The church will go around the world and lead people to Christ and everybody, and it's going to be so, kumbaya. And he was like, that is not happening. Okay, so as believers today, we should expect things to get worse and worse and worse, right? Yeah, we should like get worse and worse. As God progresses and does what he said he's okay, going to so do. Okay, so this was his second thing he said. This is number two on his prophetic creed. I believe that widespread unbelief, indifference, formalism, wickedness, which are to be seen throughout Christendom, are only what we're taught to expect in God's word. Now, what is that? What is he saying? He's, He's saying that things are going to get worse. We're going to see wickedness in the church. We're going to see evil in the church. This is what he's saying this in 1867, Renee. He says, trouble is going to come, departures from the faith, evil men waxing worse and worse. Love waxing cold are things distinctly predicted by God. You read 2 Timothy, that's the way it is. 1 Timothy, God says these very things. The love of many will grow cold. And that is what's been happening today. We see that all over the world. The so maybe a question we can be asking ourselves is, has our love for the Lord grown cold? Do we even care? Right. Do we even want to take time to listen to what he said he's going to do and to be still before him and know that he's God? Folks, let me read this next, um, the, the end of the phrase of number two. He says, so far from making me doubt the truth of Christianity, they help confirm my faith. Melancholy and sorrowful as the sight is. If I did not see it, I should think the Bible was not true. And so I see all these riots in America and all this kind of stuff. And pe the breakdown of morals is a day of lawlessness. As the man of lawlessness is getting ready to take over the earth, I'm like, well, that's what you're going to see is lawlessness. And he was saying this in 1867. Now, let me jump to what he says about Israel. Okay. Because this really is fascinating to me that he would say this. He said, I believe, this is number seven. Okay. I believe that the Jews will ultimately be gathered again as a separate nation and restored to their own land and convert it to the faith after going through a great tribulation. Now, what, that's what we teach. Okay, so in 1886, is that when this book was written? Or 1867, 18? right oh, eight, um, after the 18, Civil War. 1867. What was the land of Israel like back in 1860? It was desolate. What was happening there? Not much. It was Who desolate. Lived there? It was, it was ruled by the Turks. Okay. See, Jews did not rule over their own land since the time of the Babylonians, 586 B.C. 586 B.C. Even when Jesus came, it was ruled yeah. by the Romans. Okay. And it's always been under other nations, Renee. And guess what God said? While other nations tried to rule over it, when they tried, there never was a Palestinian state. The Romans didn't give it to them. Babylonians didn't give it to them. The Turks didn't give it to them. Nobody did. There's so, no such thing. But he says, okay, that they will get their land and there will be a great tribulation. Well, and they will come back to them because all Israel is going to be saved. My guess is, how long did J.C. Ryle live? When did he die? I don't know when he so died. So he probably didn't live to see oh, Israel. Oh, to 1900. Oh, 1900. Okay, so he didn't live to see Israel become a nation in 1948. But he believed God because he said God doesn't lie. Okay, well, here's the conflict in the churches today. This is right now. I, I, I experience this conflict. Okay. And he says this. This is number eight. I believe that the literal sense of the Old Testament prophecies has been far too neglected by the churches and is far too much neglected at the present day and that under the mistaken system of spiritualizing and accommodating Bible language, Christians have too often completely missed the meaning of the text. And, that, and that's well, what the no, Old Testament passages we're reading, they would be so misinterpreted by people. It's incredible, to, Renee, to watch. But people were blinded to the truth. Well, that's why I'm encouraging our listeners 
if, you, if you're curious as to what God says, you need to learn how to study the scriptures and read it for what it's meant to be. That's why I always say, you gotta look for what is God doing? What is God saying? Don't ask the question, it's like, what does this mean to me? Before you even know what he's saying, right? Because you don't want to misinterpret it. Right. Right. Okay, so this book, Renee, look how fat this book is, guys. It looks like All a right. textbook. This is from Horatius Bonner around this time of the Civil War. So we're talking 1860s again. He was a friend from, of J.C. Ryle, and they started a, prophet, uh, uh, a group, a missionary group, to go to Israel and reach Jews. Okay, back then, transportation wasn't right. very easy. <laughs> So this, but here's the title of the book, get this, Prophetical Landmarks Containing Data for Helping to Determine the Question of Christ's Premillennial Advent. This book is amazing. I mean, I read this book and I could not believe how sharp this guy is. And I won't go into any of this book, but you have got to read this book. This will really pump you up. They were talking about Jesus' return. This guy started, you know how I do prophecy updates every week? Yeah. He was doing that for years, Renee. He was writing on prophecy all the way back in the 1800s, and people were, it was widely were they, distributed in were Britain. Were they publishing in newspapers, or how did No, he I mean, published like, a magazine. A magazine. Yep. Yeah. And so there these pamphlets every mm -hmm. month that would go out, but he was writing every week on stuff like that mm -hmm. back then and trying to get people to see their world through God's eyes, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Okay, so fast forward, what happened, and you know, when we're doing this live, but before this virus came along, we would have a class, and I would call it History, Prophecy, and Current Events. So I always did history, and this is the history I wanna talk about before I get in today, the current events. During this time, God was raising up Jews, and what were those Jews doing? They were saying, we have to go back to our land, in the 1800s? In the 1800s. Okay. And it was called the Zionist movement. Mm -hmm. And that Zionist movement, as Satan saw Christians doing this and Jews doing what they were doing for the Zionist movement, and all of a sudden Christians and Jews coming together at that time to try to, to make a way for uh, Israel to come back to her land. And there was a British Zionist Christian. His name was Lord Balfour, Renee. Mm-hmm. And he wrote the Belfort Declaration to say, Israel needs to get all of her land back. So he just went to the Bible and drew a map, what mm -hmm. the Bible says. So he had Israel going all the way to the Euphrates River, all the way into Egypt, because they're supposed to get all of that land. Okay. Okay. And so we're talking about them just getting Judea, Samaria. Well, just think, Satan is watching this. He saw the Belfort Declaration written, so he raised up Hitler. You see, he raised up Stalin people who wanted to kill all the Jews. And so there's always this battle going on. Yeah. Renee. And this battle that was going on there, World War II and afterwards, is going on today. And what I wanna point out is it's a spiritual battle. Yes. So it's not just a battle, a physical battle for like, we wanna annex the land and countries butting heads with Israel over right. that. It's a spiritual battle because there's a whole nother world out there that is right, and these nations right. and these territories have um, spiritual beings, okay, demonic angels that fight over these lands. They, they, they inspire people to do evil things so they can keep control of these territories. The Bible talks about, they, they're called princes, the prince of Persia, the prince, these different princes, they're supernatural angelic beings yeah and most of them are evil Renee. Mm -hmm. they're on satan's sides the whole world lies in the power of the evil one the bible says but they also call the lord the lord of hosts and who are the hosts it's his army right right yeah and they're doing battle so this is not fiction this is not fairy tales this is reality and we right. want you to know about that so think about what satan wants and these evil spirits want they don't want god getting any glory they definitely don't want him getting glory through Israel. They definitely don't want him getting glory through the church. So why do you think the church is so persecuted in lands like China, like Muslim lands? The church is so persecuted because there is a, a being called the devil, Satan, and he has evil spirits and demonic spirits. Mm -hmm. And they are great. I mean, these angels are great beings mm -hmm. that God has created. 
and they are territorial beings and they are ruling over. So just think of when the Jews are trying to get their land, what do you think those beings are doing? They're fighting tooth and nail to try to stop them. They're inspiring people to do great evil yeah. to stop them. And that's what we see today. So Renee, there's, let me read some current headlines okay. that are happening right now. Okay. I'm all ears. I You're all been, ears? Okay. I haven't been reading anything. All right, listen so. to this. The Saudis and the Palestinians are clashing on Twitter over the status of the Palestinian cause. Normalization with Israel. And so the Saudis have kind of bought in. We need to be more friendly with the, with the Jews in Israel. And this is kind of, this is shocking the Muslim yes. world. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of turmoil in the Muslim world. So the Palestinians and the Saudis are going to battle. The tension between Saudis and Palestinians was evident, mainly on Twitter, where Saudi and the Palestinian users traded insults and accusations. Many Saudis tweeted under the hashtag, Palestine is not my cause, and the Zionist enemy is our brother. I, I've never heard of that. No, say that again. Explain that. Okay. Like, you lost me. Palestine is not my cause, meaning Saudi Muslims yeah. are saying, hey, Palestinians. We're not. Forget, we don't care about two-state solution. Forget you. Yeah, they're yeah, wiping their hands. Wipe our hands of these guys. Okay. But when they say the Zionist enemy, yeah. which means Israel, their enemy, is our brother, what that's, in the world is that's going on? never been a I've thing. I've never heard anything like this, friends. I mean, this is amazing. And that, so you have and it, to ask. What? And it's in prophecy yeah. that when the Gog Magog prophecy happens and Russia comes down, Saudi Arabia, you know, they back off. And this is, this is perfectly filling into that. So you need to ask that. yourself, when you hear the Saudis say that, like, what is God doing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. And so look what they're doing. They're accusing the Palestinians of ingratitude towards Saudi Arabia stating that it's time they took responsibility for their own fate. The Palestinians. Right, as the Saudis and others in the Middle East feud with the Palestinian cause, the UN, the EU, the New World Order, all side with the Palestinians, Renee. This is what's amazing. So okay, the, the Saudis... U the UN, the EU, and the New World Order side with the All side with the Palestinians, because they want a two-state solution. So they're against Israel annexing any land. Okay, okay so now let me, no, let me okay. say something about Go ahead, ask Okay, I just want to go back. For those who are listening who are unfamiliar with the term two-state solution, explain it in a sentence or two. What's this two-state solution? Okay, the two-state solution is a vehicle by which they're trying to drive Israel out of the land. They want all of the land. So two-state solution means that the Palestinians get a land void of Jews, no Jews allowed in the biblical heartland. That's why I say it's a very satanic thing. It's and a they spiritual call it two battle. states because they're right. dwelling on they the same? They call it the West Bank. They want all of the West Bank to be a Palestinian state, no Jews allowed. But Arabs, Palestinians, are allowed to live in Israel, the other part of the land. But they want to drive them out. And so that's why they, they have a two-state solution because if they can get all of that land, Israel would it'd be hard to defend yourself. And so that's a, it's a it's a horrible thing. Israel's you know? a very small country, very yeah. small. Okay, this next article is going to shock you, Renee. Okay. Okay. Despite Israeli strikes, Iranian forces massing on the Syrian border. This is from Israel National News. Tens of thousands of Iranian Iranian linked militiamen have been integrated into the Syrian army with many of them now stationed near Israel's border. Multiple drones reportedly belonging to the Israeli Air Force have carried out a new series of airstrikes against the Iranian-backed militias in the area of Dar ez Zur in eastern Syria over the weekend. This was this past weekend. So what's happening, from what I understand, what you read, there's Iranian forces that are helping out the Syrian militia. You know, it's in making them right. The Syrian army, their, their Iranian militias are dressing up like they're Syrians, but they're part of and becoming a part of the Syrian army. But they're so actually Iranian. Iranians, okay. And, okay. They're, so they're and they're bringing them from all over the Middle East. So 
Many nations in the Middle East are sending people to be with the Iranians to get in on, on this battle. And to be with against, the Syrians. Yeah, to, to be, be with, with the, the Syrians. Syrians. Yeah. So, okay, so Israel killed, um, they had eight airstrikes, right? But listen to this. According to Iranian analyst Mustafa Najafi, a staggering 53,000 Iranian-backed militia members have merged into the Syrian army on Israel's border. Renee, so that's the same? People. That's the same? Yeah. That, yeah. So now they're saying how many? 53,000. You realize how that, big our army big, that is? That's bigger than our community where yeah. we live. Yeah, there's only 52,000 in our county. And so this is huge. So Israel, what do you think Israel's doing? They're, well, they've pre been preparing for this war. And they're going to win. And okay. so this is up on the Golan Heights, Renee. North. By, that, by in the north. Yeah. Yep. Up mm -hmm. on the Syrian border. And the world says Israel's not allowed to have that land. And God says, yes, you are. That's your land. You see? This is in the territory called Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh's land. And then above it is the tribe of Dan. Mm -hmm. And so this is these two tribes are going to get all of their land back. And they don't have it all back yet. Yeah. God's going to give it back to them. Okay, so that's another one. All right, here's another. This is this week, guys, Jerusalem Post. Iran prepares to confront Israel and Syria via Hezbollah. Iran may be preparing for a conflict with Israel and Syria and no longer will accept Israeli airstrikes on its warehouses without a response. A report over the weekend suggested. So not only do they have 53,000, Mm -hmm. coming from other nations, merging in with the Syrian army. They have the Hezbollah army from Lebanon getting ready to attack Israel. And that's the other side. That's right, right next to Syria. Yep, on the Mediterranean coast. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're north of Israel also, okay? And so um, veteran journalist Elijah Magna wrote on the website Medium about whether the Great Middle Eastern War will begin in the Levant and cited Syria as the potential flashpoint. They're talking war this week. And, and Israel, they, they call it the great. They call, the they call it the great Medi uh, Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern War. War, which we would maybe call if we're following biblical prophecy. You call right. it uh, the. But here's the weird is it, thing. Wait a minute. Is it the the God, 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 God Magog? Prophecy. Okay, yeah. so here's the weird thing about Russia. Russia and Turkey are going to be a part of that war. Russia is really going to lead it. Russia moved two more groups of their top MIGs, Air Force down into Syria in the last two weeks. Okay, so they're moving more and more troops down there. They have said, okay, we're trying, they're trying to play nice between Israel and Iran. The Russians? So, right, because they have the S-300 and S-400 um, anti-aircraft -air uh, um, missile systems. The Russians do. So they could be firing at the Israeli planes. And now they're moving towards saying, Israel, you have to stop this. No more. And that will bring them in direct conflict with Russia. Now, everybody in the everybody is saying in the press, I'm reading all this stuff in the press, no, 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 there's no conflict between Russia and Israel. Well, I don't think they're reading the Bible. The Bible says there's a big conflict between Russia and Israel, and it's coming. And Russia is not really known for liking Jews. I mean, just saying, they're a very anti-Semitic nation, Renee and always have been. Mm -hmm. And so this conflict is coming because the Bible says it's coming. Russia's already there, folks. Iran is already there. Turkey's already there. Syria's already got troops they want to attack. And, to, and so this is very important. But let me give you another report that I read this week, okay? Mm -hmm. Because when I read the peace deal that Trump tried to sign with Israel and the yeah. Palestinians, the Palestinians totally rejected it. And here's why. The way Trump wrote this peace deal, it's impossible for any Muslim group or these nations to accept. Why? Because they have to accept something that's against their religion. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Fatah, Palestinian Authority, all have to agree that Israel has a right to her land. And... <laughs> They have to agree to lay down their arms and no longer fight Israel. Do you think they're ever going to agree to anything like that? 
I'm saying they cry peace, peace. There is no peace with that. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because why would you write a peace proposal like this when you know that one of the parties would absolutely have nothing to do with it? Oh, yeah. And Mahmoud Abbas has said he's got nothing to do with it. He's trying to cut off any peace deal they ever had in the past with yeah. them. Um, they want war, Renee. The European Union wants war over this. They, they all want war. They're all angry. France is angry. I read an article today. France is so angry at Israel. They're so angry. You cannot annex this land. If you annex this land, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Britain is saying that. Russia is saying that. The EU is saying that. I mean, everybody's saying it except America. So here's okay, America's like, go ahead and annex the land. Okay, so Renee, this, this annexing the land, I want you to think about what I'm about to say. Okay? All right. Think about this. Because... Jews that live in Israel believe all of that land is theirs. They don't need to annex it. It's already theirs. Yeah. Okay, so they're not annexing anything. They don't want to annex it. They just want to live there. Okay, because God said he's going to give it back. And so they've been moving in mm -hmm. and living there in what we call settlements and outposts. So listen to this article. This is what one group is doing this weekend. Okay. Okay. Trump's plan inspires Israelis to expand Israel inside the Palestinian Authority controlled regions of Judea and Samaria. That's why we wanted to talk about Judea and Samaria today, because I see God setting up this war, this battle, which everybody's going to lose. Israel's going to get even more of their land. And, and how amazing. do we know that? Is because God Because the said Bible says so. That's right. The Bible says so. So here's these Jews. Put, they go around. The car windshields throughout Judea and Samaria were plastered with flyers calling for a strategy against Trump's deal of the century. The organization behind the movement, it's all ours, meaning it's all our land anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Jews. Yeah. It's yeah. distributing leaflets with the title, Take the Struggle to the Streets Against the Division of Our Land. But at the end of the letter, the message featured a call to action, including protesting, building, and to double the size of the Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria, with no differentiation between areas A, B, and C. Okay, a, area A is all run by Palestinians. Okay. Okay, and area B and area C is Jews and Palestinians. Okay. All right. So I think Area C is all Israeli sovereignty. Area B is a mixture. Area A is all Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Okay. That Area A, there are cities there that are ancient biblical cities that God said you will possess. We read it. Yeah. They're yours. You're going to possess them. Mm -hmm. They don't possess them right now. Guess what? Pretty soon, up this summer, summer is the time for wars in Israel. And remember, 67 war, when it happened. Okay, they all, they usually happen in the summer. Yeah. And I'm thinking this summer, Renee, this, this is set up like you wouldn't believe. And t I'm telling you folks, listen, you don't have to be the prophet to see this, just read your Bible. The world is acting like we are gonna stop Israel. We, you're not getting this land. You are not gonna take Judea, Samaria. You're not gonna take the Jordan Valley. You're not gonna have those cities. And God says they are. So it's going to be fun to watch this well, summer. And, and here's a question to ask ourselves. As we're on the other side of the world, most of us listening to this broadcast, what's our response going to be? So are we going to side with God's plan or with the nations of the world? All the nations of the world. And do we need to be fearful about this big Middle Eastern war that no they're way. expecting? Or... Do we need to strengthen ourselves and remind ourselves who our God is and what he's doing is good? Okay, so I want to read two more stories yeah, from this Yeah, and then week. we have to, like, we're getting there. we got ten minutes left. No, uh, I don't. We don't care about that, <laughs> that time. Now, listen, these two stories are very important, okay, because this is where the tension is rising. It's getting bigger, 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 bigger. Okay, first, okay, um... The Syrian currency in Syria collapsed this week, this weekend. Okay, here's a, when, you're, when your currency collapsed and you've already been in this internal, internal war where you lost, mm -hmm. you know, 800,000 people killed 
and people on the run, over two million people on the run running away, that nation is, you know, it's falling apart. Mm -hmm. But now their currency fell apart, Renee. This is what it says, listen to this. Syrian currency collapses, throws country into uncertainty. I just had to laugh from the Jerusalem Post. Syria in a period of uncertainty? Well, they've, oh, been, they've been that way for eight years. Oh, it's so <laughs> sad. It is, it's very sad. I, 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 I mean, their, their, it, whole, but, their whole country's been destroyed. Yeah, Bashar Assad, the son of Hafez al-Assad. This is a wicked and evil people. I mean, what they do to people, Renee, it's just, it's terrible. And so listen to what it says. The Syrian regime thought it was finally out of the woods in its almost decade-long civil war. But the regime is gutted and weak. It has no finances. It's fighting internally with family feuds within the Assad ruling clan. It means it's like a house of cards, it's very fragile. Russia can't save the regime from everything. This illustrates that even when the conflict seems to be winding down, and Russia, Iran, Turkey increasingly work to partition Syria and drive the U.S. out, unforeseen new crises emerge. Now, the Americans are over the, the Euphrates River, okay, into what would be known as the Assyrians, okay, which is in Iraq. The ancient Assyrians, okay, yeah. In, uh, in Syria and in Iraq, all the way to the east. Yeah. Okay, that's where our troops have been. Mm -hmm. And Trump's been pulling out our troops. The Russians keep filling in. They keep coming in, okay, because the Bible says that one day they're going to be... God's going to put a hook in a jaw and they're going to drive them down there and they're going to fight and they're going to be blown away by God. That's what the Bible says. So the Syrian currency falls apart. That's very bad news for them. And so we have to pray for these people. It's terrible. But the Bible is very clear. This war is happening. Why? And why does God want war, Ray? Because, Let what me, are you going to say? I'll, okay, so we were talking about this earlier. I'm like, that sounds like a really bad thing to say. God wants war. And so, if you would ask me, why would God want war? My answer would be from scripture. God hates evil and he's gonna do away with all evil by having a final war, yeah. right? And that war is good because you're putting down evil and we just see evil more and more, um, just growing more. I can't even think yeah. of the right word. It's like gaining momentum. I don't, you know. Yeah. Maybe like a, a snowball rolling down the hill. It's just getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. And so it is good that God wants to make war against evil and right. to bring good. Because when Christ comes again and he rules in Jerusalem, in the millennium, or is it before? Yeah, there will in the be millennium. No, there will be no more tears, no, no more, more sorrows, no more wars, and there will be peace, real peace, not the kind of peace that we're... Okay, so I, this, yeah. I want to read another article because I think this is very important also. Okay. The Syria is falling apart, but listen to this. The UAA Delhi reports on Iran's military headquarters in Damascus, including a control room monitoring Iran's drones, among them drones watching the U.S. base. A report in the English language, UAE Delhi, the National provides information about the Glass House, a building near the Damascus International Airport that serves as the command and control headquarters of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Syria. This is the hub from which the IRGC Quds Force has orchestrated Iran's military efforts in the country. In other words, it's from Damascus. Okay, well, when I stood on the border yeah. of Israel and Syria, I was only about 35 miles away from Damascus. Renee, the Bible prophesies that Damascus is going to be blown away. Yeah. And Israel has attacked that glass house and only blew up part of it. Mm -hmm. And then they rebuild it. I am telling you, soon Damascus will stop being a city on the face of the earth. Why? Because God said he's going to destroy Damascus from the face of the earth and make it like Sodom and Gomorrah. It will be gone. And if you saw pictures of Damascus today, half of that city is just, it's, it's just rubble, like World War II pictures of Berlin and the other cities that got blown away. This is what Damascus is even like today. Half that city is blown away. The rest of it is going bye-bye. The Iranians setting up there, the Russians setting up there, all these people setting up there, bye-bye. 
And a, a few years ago, and this report went out and people missed it. I don't know why more people, I don't know why more pastors didn't talk about it. But Syria threatened Israel. And Israel came out with a threat back. And the veiled threat was, we'll nuke you. And Damascus, I was like, whoa, that was a veiled threat from Israel I've never seen before. Israel's not playing around, folks. Israel has the greatest military, but guess what? They have the greatest God. This God who said in the Bible that he is using Israel as a way for all of us. We need to submit to him and what he wants on the earth. And he wants Israel back in his land. Hey, that's what he wants. Let's go. We have an obligation as Christians to support that. Okay, so I'm imagining, like, what if this unfolds, like, in the very near future? What will our response be? And, and what can you do if all of a sudden you see all hell breaking loose over there? Okay? Let me plead with you and say, if you see that happening and you're scared, or if you're just wondering what's going on, choose to bow down before the God of Israel, before Jesus Christ, his son, and choose to side with him. So how do you become a child of God? And I think this is really important to talk about because we got to connect with what God's doing with our own lives, mm -hmm. okay? So I think you need to understand that each one of us, like it says in Genesis 1, we are made in the image of God. Every single person, no matter what race or color you are, male or female, we all have value because we are created in the image of God. And then later on in Genesis, is it 12 where God makes the promise or 15? 12. Okay, Genesis 12, same book of the Bible. He makes a promise and says, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and through, you know, future Israel, right? Yeah. And so... That's how we, as non-Jews, get to be adopted as sons and daughters of God when we believe him, just like Abraham did. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't get to become God's son because he was a good guy, right? He had his problems. Right. He's a liar. <laughs> yeah, and Renee, let me say a word yeah. about that, and it's the word reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation with God yeah. if you're an enemy of God. And God has enemies. He says, I will avenge myself of my enemies. But let me read what salvation really is all about, because it's about reconciliation. It's two enemies now have peace. And a relationship. Right? So let, yeah. let me read. It's out of Romans chapter 5, and I'm just going to get, this is a summary of what we call the gospel, the good news of the gospel. And you know what? We, we need good news in this day, and it's free. Right. It's free. Therefore, this is verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. How did I get that peace with God? All right. I'm justified by faith. In other words, God gives me a righteousness, not my own, because I believe what he did through the sacrifice. I believe that the blood which was shed is shed for me. And that would and be so Jesus' blood. so it would take blood. away my sin, right. Yeah. And so this is what he says, so listen up. Very, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Pay attention to that. All of you, who are not Christians today are still enemies of God. But you don't have to remain that you way. You don't have to remain enemy. Because it's a free gift of God, not because of anything you've ever done. And so nobody and reconciliation is yeah. when there's a peace deal. Now we have peace. It's not a two-state solution? Right, it's not a two-state solution. Yeah. I mean, it is, this, is, uh, this is like God saying, look, I will have peace with you. I will reconcile you to myself through the shed blood of my son, and that which is, is eternal. And well, we, I want to say that is the great love of God. He said, I'm not going to shed your blood, even though it's required of you. He said, I will shed the blood of my son. Yep. And you know? so not only this, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the 
reconciliation. That's what we get from him. And so I love Romans 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's how you get saved. Yeah. Because we become, I give God my sin, he gives me his righteousness. And That's a great deal. That's and the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of the gospel. And what action do we have to do? What's required of us? Believe. We, we have to believe. And with that, we could talk for a long time. That's why we like to meet with you every Wednesday night if you're interested. So we'll continue our conversation about history, prophecy, and current events. But if you have heard the gospel tonight and you feel God drawing you to himself, don't wait another moment. Don't wait. Don't wait. Because the time is so short. We're talking this summer, there could be a huge war in Israel and Jesus could come back. And you don't want to be left behind you because it's going to be, be seven behind. years of awful tribulation. Yep. So how do you receive Christ? You humble yourself before him. You pray. You talk to him and say, tell him, God, I believe in you. I'm a sinner, but I know that the blood of your son covers my sin and I believe. And so... Do that tonight Great if God word. is working in your life. And we'll talk to you next week. Do you want to say a prayer? I will pray for everybody. All right. We bless you, O Lord, our God, our King. You are the King of the universe, but you are the King of salvation. And we thank you that you are the one who can save us. Thank you for working so mightily in the whole earth. About the way that you have shed your blood for everybody on the earth, Lord. And so we thank you for doing that. Now we just pray, open the hearts of the people. Thank you for what you're doing in Israel, how you're giving them their land back, just like you promised them. And you promised that Israel would be a blessing to the whole world. So thank you for doing that through them for us. Help us to accept it, to honor it, to thank you for it. But especially make the churches, Lord, glorify you for what you are doing today, because it's so unbelievable it's miracle after miracle, I see, happening. So help us to give you praise and thanks to the miracles that you have done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks, um, for spending an hour with us tonight, or just part of it if you joined us late. Why don't you consider teaming with us? So what, what can you do to help spread the good news of the kingdom of God? Share this with a friend. Tag someone and let them know and hear from God's word and hear how they too can come to know him yep. and learn about what he's doing. Because you know what? This is big. This we'll is see big. you next week. Thank you.